Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. But God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding, His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life, it's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious, think well, advance good. This is Q. Welcome to the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons. Glad to have you back with us. And we're going to just keep pushing into this question about what is the kind of culture we're living in? What does it mean to be a Christian right now? How is it that the people, your neighbors, your colleagues, the people you go to school with, a college with, or even church with, how are they feeling about faith? How are they feeling about Christians? How are they feeling about just religion and public life in general? I think we all understand like things are changing pretty dramatically, and the respect level for those who claim to be people of faith or Christian is decreasing in a major way, especially with the next generation. And so this nine-minute talk is just going to give you the beginning glimpse into what is taking place, and it's going to be given by David Kinneman. David's the president of the Barna Group, and, and what I love about David, he's been there for 21 years, and this is a significant research firm. Uh, their firm and his time there and his own work, they've overseen over a million interviews. What I love about David is he, he really combines two lenses that I think are so helpful for Christians and for leaders. And those lenses are, one, what are the spiritual trends happening in general in the church in generations? But combining that with what are the cultural trends? Where is the traction being gained in our culture? And where are these two things intersecting? And what are the conflicts that come out of that? But also, what are the opportunities? And so David and I had the privilege of writing two books together. One was called Unchristian back in 2007. And then most recently this spring launched a book called Good Faith, Being a Christian When Society Thinks You're Irrelevant and Extreme. And so in this talk, David actually gives a nine-minute talk on helping us understand why is it that people think that people of faith are irrelevant. So join me in listening to this nine-minute talk. So I've spent the last 10 years studying millennials. I've done tens of thousands of interviews with this emerging generation of teens and young adults trying to understand their spiritual journeys. Uh, As a social researcher, I'm a geek. Spreadsheets are like my love language. And so I look at these trends, trying to understand patterns, trying to understand what is true about this generation and why is it that so many of them are walking away from faith. And what we see in our research is that literally millions of millennials, young people, are expressing frustration, a sense of disconnection with faith and religion. Uh, Many of the people that grow up in Christianity, about 59% end up walking away either from their faith or from the church at some point in their lives. And this is just one indicator of the irrelevance of faith in our culture today. Another thing that we've been seeing in our research, which is really incredible, is that an increasing number of people believe that essentially all of the good that's happening in our culture uh, would happen without people of faith or without religious institutions. More than half think that there would be really good charitable work without any people of faith doing that. And this is actually not at all true. Much of what is happening for good in our communities around the world actually happened because of Christian organizations and Christian individuals who are serving the, the common good in their areas. And this is just another indicator of how the relevance of faith is rising. In fact, what we're seeing across so many different cultures is that many people believe that you can live a pretty good life without Christianity. In fact, in the the United Kingdom, we did a study where we asked people about whether they they thought following Jesus would have any impact on civic life, on generosity, and we found very little correlation in the connection between following Jesus and those other aspects of life. Christianity has become really sort of in, in the background for many people, and they become indifferent to it. Well, the irrelevance of faith is just one part of the challenges that we're facing today. This has sort of been a long burn over the many, many decades, maybe even many centuries, as people have sort of put faith and religion on the shelf and sort of said that's just sort of mysticism and myth. Uh, But what we're actually seeing in our research is another kind of perception that is incredibly important for us to realize, which is extremism. And an increasing number of people in our world actually believe that Christianity is extremist. And you can see here that religion, 46% of the survey respondents that we interviewed said they believe religion is actually part of the problem in our world. 
after the Paris attacks, when people said they were praying for the, the victims of the, the terrorism, uh, some of the social media was like, we don't want your prayers in religion, we just want our friendship. They actually believe that religion is part of the problem. They don't even want a, a spiritual solution to the problem of, of sort of grieving about the terrorist attacks. What we also discovered is that 42% said it's not just religion that's part of the problem, it's actually people of faith that are part of the problem in our culture today. And so this is part of this idea of extremism. Let me just show you some of the interesting things we found in the research. What we, we went through a whole range of different kinds of beliefs and activities and we found that 93% of adults said that it was extremist to try to use religion to justify violence. Sometimes I wonder where, what are the other 7% thinking? But widely viewed as extremist, if you use religion to justify violence. But look at these other things that are increasingly viewed to be social extremism. 60% believe that if you try to convert somebody to your faith, that that is an extremist kind of act. We find that 52% believe that if you have the traditional view on marriage, that same-sex relationships are morally wrong, that that is an extremist position. We also found that 42% said that if you were to leave a good-paying job and go to serve as a missionary somewhere in a foreign culture, that would be an extremist act. So what's so interesting is that people are, you know, indifference and irrelevance says that faith can be on the margins and it doesn't really matter in our life. What what this idea of extremism tells us is that people are saying religion actually is part of the problem that needs to be removed from our public life. This is increasing in intensity over the last decade as people are sort of wondering how is it that we can build shared societies in a pluralistic context? How do, how do we honor what is different about us? Because we all bring our own types of extremism to the table as committed Christians these aren't just things we've sort of voted on and believe that they're important because they just seem to be, be popular. We actually believe that, that scripture matters in this context. So how do we respond to this? Well, there's a lot of different things we could think about, but we don't have to like these trends, but we do have to deal with them. Whatever our context in neighborhoods, in businesses, as faith leaders, we have to wrestle with the context of the irrelevance of faith, of the increasing social extremism of our convictions. I think this is an incredible and healthy moment for the Christian community to wrestle, to struggle with, what does it mean to live out our Christianity in this increasingly skeptical age? Listen, there's all sorts of things we could talk about, but let me just give you a couple of examples of how we might respond to this. First, we could look at the fact that with this generation, one in four millennials think they'll be famous or well-known by the time they're 25. <laughs> this is just incredible. One in four millennials believe that they're going to be famous or well-known. And, you know, we could say this is a narcissistic generation. They're watching too many reality television shows. They're watching, you know, YouTube and seeing other of, of their friends become, you know, famous and well-known on, on uh, you know, these digital channels. But what would we say if we, if we took Ecclesiastes, a book of the Bible that actually talks about ambition and fame and influence and gave us a deep theological point of view towards this enduring question, a generation that wants to be famous and well-known might find themselves, might find some truth about themselves in the pages of Ecclesiastes. This is a place where Christianity uh, isn't just trying to be relevant to be cool, but could actually help to say, to be a person of faith, you could actually you know, understand the truth about ourselves through the pages of Scripture, to understand the countercultural truth of Scripture. Listen, our beliefs matter. Being irrelevant and extreme for the sake of these beliefs is a good thing when they're expressed in love for our communities and for the people around us. Another way we could sort of respond to the, the sort of the trends, the sort of increasing skepticism in our culture uh, is we could follow the, the wisdom of, of Hebrews 10, 24, which says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good faith. I think that the Christian community could be known to, uh, to recognize uh, examples and expressions of good faith in the people and places around us. There are so many ways in which we're already doing good kingdom things and we should notice them and acknowledge them and, and try to do more of them. I've noticed in doing this research that it's so hard for us to, to acknowledge the good things sometimes even our brothers and sisters in Christ are doing. And I just wanted to sort of close by being very specific about some things that I've noticed in thinking about how it is we could acknowledge and motivate one another to do acts of love and service for the sake of Jesus in our world. My friend Pam, 
has done an incredible job uh, for many years as a single mom, loving and caring for her kids. And my friend Brooke and Christian are doing such incredible work serving in terms of racial reconciliation in Atlanta. A good friend of mine, Gareth, he's a Scot. Uh, he's actually now a pastor in England. And uh, one of the cool things is he's, his story of going up and praying for people, which by the way, majority of people believe that if you pray for a person in public, that's an extremist act. It doesn't matter to Gareth. He's actually praying for his friends, praying for people uh, in public places. And I just want to acknowledge the good work that Gareth is already doing and see him do more of that. I could think about my sister, Sherry, who, was, uh, who, who at Christmas time went and visited an Iraqi refugee family and gave them food and clothes and just loved on that family. I, I also think about another friend of mine, Lindsay McMillan, who's in Australia, who's trying to think about ways that faith ought to influence the workplace in Australia. These are all just a few examples of good faith Christians trying to do good in their world, trying to bring their faith out of the margins and into the lives of people that they know. How can we be people of encouragement to, to love and accept and find that our, our beliefs actually matter in this skeptical age? I think that Christians can be defined by the good that they do in the world and that this incredible moment of skepticism is a, a huge opportunity for the Christian faith today. I think we as Christians can be known for all the things we're for and for the people that we're for rather than just for the things that we're against. Thank you. I know that just gave you a little bit of a taste of, of some of the research that we really unpack in the book, Good Faith. And you can actually see more about that at goodfaithbook.org. But the cool thing about this talk is it wasn't just a talk given at our National Q Conference, what was part of something we call Q Commons. And, and the Q Commons event is something that takes place in multiple cities simultaneously, over 75 cities in places all around the U.S. and around the world where people gather for one evening and we broadcast three talks that go global. And so David Kinnaman was giving one of those talks, that's what you just heard, but then that's combined with some other talks and then local talks where each of these cities curate their own three local talks dealing with topics and issues that they want to engage in their community. And you can learn more about that at qcommons.com. That's Q-C-O-M-M-O-N-S. And if you're interested in hosting this in your city, no matter where you live around the world, contact us. We'd love to talk to you because part of our mission is to see these kinds of conversations happening in a way that brings people together in your own local context so that you can understand what does it mean to practice faith right where you're at. I hope you'll join us as we continue learning and continue these conversations and hearing these talks on our next episode of the Q Podcast. Invite your friends to join us. Start following us at Q Ideas on Twitter or Instagram. And we hope you'll join us again for the next episode as we continue learning together on the Q Podcast. <music>